God bless you for joining us today. What a privilege to be gathered at the feet of the Lord, to partake of his goodness, and to experience in his benevolence in such a, a miraculous way. Today we are going to get into God's word and enjoy the buffet of divine revelation. We're going to experience a dimension of his grace that will propel us into a divine advantage. But before we get into God's word, I want you to prepare yourself as you now begin to engage and to stimulate your faith, to awaken that dimension of the miraculous, to know that you are not just coming for information or just to interact with people in the church. You just want to also recognize that you are coming before God. The Bible says we have come before Zion with innumerable company of angels. We just made it perfect. We always have that awareness that we are not just gathered in a building, we are not just gathered wherever we are watching, but we are gathered in the presence of the Lord. So I want you to just take a moment and just begin to praise God, extol his name, and magnify him, adorn him, lift him up, for he alone is worthy to be praised, he alone is worthy to be glorified. Father, we bless your name and we thank you. What an awesome opportunity to come before you for which you all things are possible and we lift you up and we adore you and we glorify you because you are worthy, you are glorious, you are magnificent. Hallowed be thy name, O God. You are the God of creation, our heavenly Father. We thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together with you. And Father, we thank you as we have come. We know that you are going to open a dimension of your favor and we are going to experience the miraculous. We are believing you, O oh God, for something supernatural. We thank you. I want everybody just lift up your voice and ask the Lord for the kingdom of God to be made manifest in your life, asking for his presence. We pray for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. For without him, we can't do anything. The Bible says, ask him that his kingdom come, that his will be done here on earth. We need God's will to be established, to manifest, to be tangible in our lives. We are not here just because of intellectual stimulations. We are not just want to be excited about information. We want a divine impartation. We pray for a transformation in the light of his word. So open your mouth and pray for the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and engulf you with the presence of God. That as you are uh, beginning to uh, allow him to influence you, he's going to open your eyes to understand the word. He will enlighten your eyes that you might behold him and experience wondrous things in God's word. Father, we thank you. And we bless you for your Holy Spirit, for your delight to give your kingdom. And so we ask and we receive that your very tangible manifestation of your presence is our portion, Lord. We thank you and we bless you. And we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you adoration for everything that you do. In Jesus' marvelous name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Come on, just lift up your voice again and just bless the name of the Lord. Magnify him and extol him. Adore him for he is worthy. Is worthy to be praised. Today I have a word for you that is very pertinent, it's very necessary. It is very necessary because it addresses what it takes for us to go to the dimension to experience and to be able to embark on our destiny. Without this, you are going to be crippled from experiencing the best of God. And I want to take my scripture today from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It is a popular scripture that everybody knows. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Father, we thank you for your word. And we submit ourselves for the understanding. Give me glory and praise in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Jesus had to address a very pertinent concern of his disciples. And it was necessary for him to 
bring resolution to their challenge because until that is addressed, it was going to obstruct and impede the ability to respond and fulfill the mandate of the kingdom. The disciples, although they were close to the Lord and had experienced his miracles and enjoyed such deep and intimate fellowship with him, and they have no doubt about his supernatural feats, they were concerned about their necessities, what they will eat, what they will be clothed on with, where they will sleep. The necessity of their livelihood was a challenge. And so Jesus began a discourse to address this relevant challenge to their early lifestyle. Because until that is addressed, it was going to obstruct their liberty to pursue the mandate of God. And you understand this, that we cannot pursue spiritual excellence without addressing physical necessities. And you are fully liberated from the bondage of poverty. You are not free enough to engage in the excellency of your spirituality. And so Jesus started his narrative by making a profound statement by saying that you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God or mama. Either you love one and hate the other or you will be attached to one or you are going to make sure that you are detached from the other. And so Jesus' statement is that the only person here on earth that literally obstructs and impedes and fights the liberty of believers is really not Satan but his mammon. And you understand what I'm talking about? The competition of the opposition to divine manifestation or establishment in your head. It's mammon. That's what the Bible says. The love of money is the root of all evil. If you have not been able to be liberated from the love of money, then you will be polluted, you will be entangled, you will be influenced by that money. And it's going to cause you to deviate, take a tangent from the right path of righteousness and you're going to find yourself pierced through with a whole lot of evil. Jesus says that you can't serve God and serve mammon at the same time. So either you are serving one and you are hating the other. And so the only way that you can come into the liberty to truly serve the Lord, that means you need to come to a place where you are free of man, mammon. Because as long as you have not been able to take off your necessities, be responsible in your daily livelihood, find ways and means to address the cost of living, then it's going to be difficult for you to now be free to serve the Lord. So God understands this. And so he has to make sure that when God comes into our life, he also has to give us the strategy. He, he must give us the spiritual power, authority to break the cycle of mammon of our life. But we must have a, a very incredible, tangible, practical steps by which we can be able to free ourselves from the daily concerns and anxiety of life. How many of you cannot pray? Because you are worried about your needs and your concerns. How many are, are so frustrated that it has literally caused you not to be able to think right? The oppression of your necessity has literally affected the, the, your peace. Your serenity is completely disparate. Something is wrong with you because... There are things that is a penny that it, it will only take money to solve. That's what the Bible says, the blessing of the Lord, it make it rich and add no sorrow to it. And so this riches that God blesses you with becomes a stronghold of protection and defense against any onslaught of poverty that will entangle you and impede you from becoming who God wants you to be. If you don't have money, you can fulfill your purpose. There are relationships that is being affected because of the pressure of money. 
their marriage relationship that is on the verge of separation or divorce just because of misunderstanding the pressure of money. How many people compromise their faith? Excuse themselves from the path of righteousness. They have legitimate excuse why they cannot be completely devoted to the things of the spirit because money talks and it is necessary for them to converse with that language so that they can take off the burden, the needs of their life and that has caused them to deviate from the fellowship of the spirit. And so what am I talking about today? What I'm saying to you today without money, without your ability to address your necessity and your concerns, you are going to struggle and it's going to be a challenge to fulfill the mind of God. You are going to find yourself going through a process and maybe you will endure but you will not enjoy your Christian life. Without money, it's going to be difficult for you to really have that job to experience the serenity to be able to pursue your destiny engage in your servant because if the Bible says that we should preach the gospel, it is not just communication of the information. Many of us, we keep on talking about the good news, but we don't have the means, the money to be able to communicate, not just the news, but to impart the good. When somebody is hungry, they don't want your preaching, they just want to be fed. When somebody is naked, they want to be clothed. When somebody is struggling with necessity, the best way to communicate the good news to them is not to talk to them about your theology and your denominational dogma. They need you to solve their problem. And many of us, we talk spiritual, but when it comes to the tangible manifestation systems, uh, strategies that will solve problems, we don't have what it takes. And so you are going to find now that although we are so... Trans, uh, we have said transcendental wisdom in the church and we, we get excited about our drama and, and, and then we, we go through the pity of our church. We have no relevance in society because we don't have the money to contribute to the solutions of life. That is why God wants us to really come into that revelation to understand it's about time we find out what it takes to get our needs met. Not just get our needs met, but to have a surplus to have enough to not just to take care of ourselves but to be able to influence society. It's time for you to understand that the poor person will always serve the rich and the borrower is always going to serve the lender. Until we become rich, then our message will not have the impact on society because nobody wants to hear a broke person even though he's talking about a rich God. It's about time we wake up and understand that. And so Jesus needed to address this issue. So he began to use a whole lot of illustrations. He began to talk about the birds of the air. The father feeds them. God orchestrates scenarios and circumstances to feed even the birds of the air. And we human beings are better than the birds. He's talking about the lilies of the field. The Lord began to clothe this lily with gorgeous, really beautiful garments. And yesterday, within a short time, this grass is literally withered and they lose all this beauty and they are bent. And still God, still by his benevolence and, and his extreme uh, abundance has the ability, the creativity to clothe this grass with beauty. And so Jesus began to use all this illustration to build your faith, to let them understand that God is much more concerned about their necessity, much more, they are, much more than their burden for his uh, solutions. Many of us, we think that God just wants us to be spiritual and live an ascetic life and struggle and challenge. That is a proof of our spirituality. But that is not true. God wants you to walk in abundance. The Bible says he came that you may have life and have life abundantly. God wants you to live in abundance. God doesn't want you to live broke in poverty. It, it, it does not reflect right about his kingdom. The glory of the king is literally measured by the beauty, the, by the state of the citizens of his country, of his domain. 
And so God wants us to rightly communicate the life of the of his kingdom, not just to talk about the information of the kingdom, but we need to live. He says, let his kingdom come, let his will be done here on the earth it is in heaven. People should look at you and see the glamour, the beauty, the glory of heaven. People should look at you and see the, the extravagance of your God in heaven. They are walking on gold. God wants us to move into the dimension of wealth beyond the economy of this world. But we don't know what to do. And so Jesus began to address this and began to show them what it takes to be able to access the abundance of God. Jesus began to show them and give them all this, this illustration and he makes a very strange pronounce, pronoun, I mean, began to tell them about how the Gentiles struggle to get their needs met. He said the Gentiles always are seeking after all these things. The Gentiles. And so the moment Jesus says that he categorized people on earth into two groups, Gentiles and the children of God. The Gentiles seek after all these things. They seek after what they will eat. They pursue after what it will take for them to be clothed, where they will be housed, a place where they, they will be able to live. They are always thinking about the cost. And that is what motivates them, drives them to make money to, so that they can sustain themselves and take off their necessity. There's nothing wrong with that. The Gentiles seek after these things. The Gentiles have no covenant relation with God. God is not responsible for the provision of the Gentiles. They have to seek after all these things. They don't get any divine intervention. There's no sovereign orchestration to literally give them an advantage because they are connected to God the Father. And so when Jesus said the Gentiles seek after all, they say, we the children of God are not supposed to seek things like the Gentiles. We are not supposed to operate like them. There, there must be a unique, uniqueness, a distinctiveness, and something that reflects our status as the children of the Most High God. And so Jesus said, your heavenly Father knows you have need, all the, of, of, you, you have need of all these things but he does not expect us to seek after these things like the Gentiles. And so you don't have to work double work and, and strive and be anxious and, and, and overwhelmed and be depressed because of your necessity, because you are a child of God. You are not supposed to go through the hardship of the Gentiles. You don't have to go through the complicity of how to figure out life. You, you don't have to go through that. The Gentiles seek after all these things. Your pattern of experiencing them and believing God for your, expect, uh, your needs must be different from the Gentiles. It's unfortunate that many believers don't know this, so we are competing for resources with the Gentiles. We operate like them. We are anxious like them. There's no uniqueness, there's no distinction. There's no difference between us and the Gentiles. Why? Because we have not been taught to understand there is benefit of we being the children of God. We are unique, distinct. We have a father who never gave birth to vagabonds. He's a responsible father. He's a heavenly father. He knows everything you are going through. He knows your necessity before he became, it became your experience. The Bible says, Jesus said, your father in heaven knows that you have need of all these things. He's integrally involved and concerned about every need before it becomes your reality. He has already got the understanding of the uniqueness of your necessity. He knows what you are going through. But the question is, if he knows what you are going through, if he knows your necessity, if he loves you, why will he not just supply it and take care of it? It's a mystery. But he loves you. But he's not going to just supply your needs. Without you understanding how to be able to access your heritage, your privilege as a status of the Son of God, 
God expects you to understand something to be able to access uh, what he has for you. So it is not that he cannot take care of you. It is not about the shortage of resources. It's not that it is difficult for God to access your, your situation with his divine resource. It is not that. The problem is we are ignorant of how we are supposed to relate with the Father to access the providence that he has allocated for us as children of the Most High God. And that is what we want to talk about. So Jesus makes this comparison the gentle seek after all these things. Your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things. Now, if Jesus had to had stopped over there without addressing the fact that the father knows it, and yet he wants to go further and give us everything we need, then we will have questioned his compassion towards us. But we know that the integrity, his sovereignty, and who he is, his love. And so God cannot just wait to give you everything you need. The Bible says he delights to give you his kingdom. If he delights to give you the kingdom, how much more what you need? The Bible says if he gave us his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, why will he not with him give us all things? Jesus was made poor that through his poverty we might be rich. And so the problem is not the resources, but the we, are, we don't know how to access the abundance of God. That is the challenge. And that's what we need to address. And so Jesus now began to tell them how to be able to access what God has ordained for them. And he makes a very profound statement in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And so God is not saying that we should not seek after the things we need. But he makes us understand for as children of God, we must seek first the kingdom and his righteousness before we even think about seeking any other. So we need to prioritize the kingdom and his righteousness to position us and to qualify us on how to be able to access the other things. So this, this is what the Lord is saying. If you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then you don't need to seek after the other things. You, need to, you don't need to try to figure out, come out with strategies and ideas, laboriously go after it. Because when you seek after the kingdom and his righteousness, it activates a kingdom benefit that all these things that you desire and you want, it will be added unto you. And so therefore, God is saying, don't go and seek after the other things like the Gentiles do because they don't have the blessing, the benevolence, the assets of the kingdom, the authority of the kingdom, and, and the blessing of the kingdom. So they have to pursue things. But when we prioritize the kingdom and its righteousness, then we are now positioned to activate the sovereign power of God. We mobilize divine resources. We begin to attract the creator of God. We begin to release the power of God to locate what we need and to attract it to our locality. I don't care your vicinity or whatever struggles you are going through. That thing will begin to come to you. You become an attractive force. You don't repel things. Things are not subtracted from you. you are not, they are not going to steal from you, but it will be added to you. It will locate you in the location where you are. I don't care the geographical location. I don't care where they put you. It will, look, it will be added unto you. And so Jesus is saying, we must seek the kingdom and the righteousness and then use that as the platform, as the means to really attract those things that we need. How does that happen? Because Jesus knows without the kingdom and its righteousness that we are not authorized to be an attractive force to the resources of God's creation. But when we see first the kingdom and the righteousness, something happens. Therefore, God makes us aware through his son Jesus Christ 
that it is only sons, his children, who have the right to be the license to seek first to seek the kingdom. And so anybody who is a child of God does not automatically have access to the kingdom. But when you are a child of God, you are qualified to seek the kingdom. You have to use your own volition to make that decision by your own way to make the choice to seek after the kingdom. And so you are born again to be qualified, to, give, to be given the right to now pursue the kingdom and his righteousness. That is not something that is available to Gentiles. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? And the reason why God gives you the kingdom and his righteousness is not just to have access to the label or the title, but it gives you access to everything that is in the realm of God. Because when you have the kingdom and his righteousness, then you have the key to access the bank of the kingdom. You have access to everything. See first the kingdom and his righteousness. God is making you aware that you don't struggle to get the kingdom. You are not trying to seek the kingdom and God is going to begin to begin to check you out and wonder before. No, as long as you are a child of God and is your father, you have the right to ask him and receive it. That's why Jesus, when he was teaching about his prayer, he says, ask the father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth. And so therefore, as children of God, we have the right. It is our privilege. It's our heritage to be able to seek the kingdom anytime you want. And we can. So anytime you need anything, you have to ask yourself this question. Have you sought the kingdom? Is the kingdom in your possession right now? Do you have the reality of the kingdom? Do you have the experience of the kingdom? Do you have the evidence of the kingdom and his righteousness? Those two things are very necessary for your supply. It has nothing to do with your bank account, your ethnicity, your geographical location. It has nothing to do with the political upheaval of your vicinity. It has nothing to do with that. You are not going to be contained and limited and restricted because of the currency of your country. You should not be limited just because of the shortage of your circumstance. I don't care the background you came from. When you are in the kingdom, you are not operating on human economy. You are operating on the economy of God's glory. He supply all our needs, not by our bank account or our occupation or our job. He supply all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And many of us, we limit our ability to believe God for more because we are always looking at our natural resources, our bank account, our job. So even if God is trying to give you a dream, you are trying to limit yourself because you measure your bank account to determine what you can perceive. No. If you are in the kingdom, then the glory of the kingdom is yours. The riches of the kingdom is yours. The ability to access the bank of the kingdom is your portion. And so Jesus says, do you know what? Don't limit yourself and try to find ways and means to go after these things. See first the kingdom and its righteousness and then utilize the kingdom and the righteousness to access everything by you becoming an attractive force. You are authorized to now begin to get those things to come to you. You become one that your things are not subtracted from you anymore. Things are now beginning to add to you. When you now seek first the kingdom and the righteousness as a son, as a child of the Most High God, things are added to you. So who's doing the adding? How does it happen? What does it take for these things to happen to you? How does it work? Because when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, the mere fact that you have sought the kingdom and his righteousness and you possess it. If things are being added to you, it is not just automatic. Jesus never said we should not seek after other things, but the way we seek after things is not like the Gentiles. So we get the kingdom and the righteousness and it changes our perspective. We are elevated to a place of authority. We enter into a dimension of uniqueness. We have a way to now have an incredible sovereign authority over the creative forces of great, great creature of God. 
And because now we are in that level, we now utilize the kingdom authority and our status as righteous people to now command those things to come to us. Because you see, when you are in the kingdom of God, you are not just there passively. Now you take control of your own life. The kingdom of God gives you the liberty to make choices. It's not, you are not going to be a slave or passive. In the kingdom of God, he has made you a king and a prince in his house. And so when you enter into the kingdom, you are now free to make decisions as God is influencing you. So the kingdom of God authorizes you to succeed, but you need to use that authority. And so the reason why things are coming to you is because you are commanding it to come to you. And so the mere fact that you've got the kingdom and this righteousness does not mean that you passive sit down and things are added. No. You now begin to seek after the other things, but you don't pursue it. You command it to come to you because now you are a king. In the kingdom of God, the children of God are kings. And because you are king, you are authorized to succeed. It is your duty now to decree it and command it and come to you. And so how the things will be located, how it will now be released, how it will be attracted to you is not your responsibility. Your duty now is to use the authority of the king in the kingdom of God. Because in the kingdom of God, you have servants who are angels. As you decree and pronounce what you need, the angels of God take that word because you are a king. And then they begin to now locate those things, bring it to you. It shall be added unto you. Are you understand what I'm talking about? And so the way we get what we need is not like the gender. They don't have access to angelic ministration like God has given to us. So when the Lord says, see first the kingdom and his righteousness, he's making you aware that you have the ability, the authority as a king in the kingdom of God to be able to access everything by speaking it. How it will be done is none of your business. The methodology to get it done is none of your business. How it will locate you is not none of your business. Your duty is to decree the end, the result, and it will be done for you. It will be established. The Bible even tells us that if you have faith, which is the life of those in the kingdom, you shall say to this mountain, be uprooted and be planted in the sea. You shall say to this tree, be uprooted, this sacrament will be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it shall obey, it shall be done for you. Now, who is doing it for you? It's the angels. And so, your duty right now to, uh, to understand, don't try to figure out how it will be added. Your duty is to use the authority of God. You are looking for a job. Don't seek the job like everybody else. Your duty now is to speak the result. But the question is, are you in the kingdom? And are you operating in the righteousness of God? When I'm talking about righteousness of God, I'm not talking about your moral status. I'm talking about your position in relationship to the king. Righteousness is not just morality. It is your position in the kingdom. And the only reason why you are positioned in the kingdom in such a state for you to be able to operate in the authority of God is not because you are holier than thou. This righteousness is a gift See, what we're talking about the kingdom, the kingdom of God is the reality of his presence. It's the tangible manifestation of his glory. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so when the Holy Ghost comes upon you in a tangible manifestation, he makes manifest the kingdom. He is the embodiment of the kingdom. So the Holy Ghost comes upon your life and he now becomes, he manifests the kingdom. Jesus said that if I cast out demons by the Holy Ghost, then the kingdom of God has come among thee. And so when we're talking about kingdom, we're talking about the tangible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And every believer has the right to access the kingdom. The kingdom of God is available for every believer. God wants us to now access the kingdom and then use that authority to command, decree, 
and call things to come to us. Instead of we trying to figure out, we're trying, you, you are delaying yourself because you are waiting for a strategy. You are trying to put things into perspective. You are, you are looking for opportunity. You are, wait, you are waiting for things to fall in place. No. When you don't see anything, when you don't know how it will be done, your duty is to speak as the Holy Ghost has come up. You don't speak until the Holy Ghost is with you. When you feel the Spirit of God as you ask the Lord, because you are a son, and you know you are working in righteousness because of your status in the kingdom, immediately you have the right to begin to decree everything you need. And as you speak, the Bible says, all these things shall be added unto you. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to try to figure out God has made you a king here on earth. And he cannot wait for you to demonstrate the authority of sonship so you can access the resources of heaven. It's about time we understand how we get the resources we need. It's not, it's not like the Gentiles. Many of us, we don't see the miraculous provision of God. We don't see the uniqueness of his abundance. We don't see the sovereignty of his grace. We have not experienced the abundance of his grace. Why? Because we are operating like the Gentiles. And today, I hope as you have received this revelation and understood what God wants you to do, it's about time you know for sure that if you begin to operate like that, things will fall into place without you knowing how. You are going to get that job without even understanding it, how you got it. You'll find opportunities activated for you. You are going to have encounters that will, it will shock you. Why? Because you are operating on a new dimension of faith. You shall say these things and it will happen for you. And so before I close, I want you to just lift up your hands and, and wherever you are, thank God that he is your heavenly father. Bless him and give him glory and honor and adoration. God is a responsible father. He knows what you are in need of. He knows what you are in need. If he delights to give you his kingdom, what will he what will he reward from you? If he gave you his only begotten son, then with him he will give you all things. So lift up your voice and begin to talk to, talk to God. Say, Father, right now, my God, my Savior, my deliverer. Lift up your voice and say, Father God, I thank you. And I bless you that you are my heaven, Father, and I give you glory. And right now, lift up your voice and say, Father, I ask you for the kingdom and I receive. I receive the Holy Spirit. I receive the tangible manifestation of your presence. Lift up your voice and begin to thank God. And if you can pray in the Holy Spirit, pray. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. And if you, you don't know how to praise in the Holy Ghost, then come up and begin to praise God. Lift up your voice and begin to thank God for the Holy Spirit. Until you begin to sense Him on your body, until you feel Him, until you begin to experience the tangible manifestation of His presence. The moment you do that, you are now in the right position to command every resources you need. Don't say it until you can feel it. When you know he's with you, you can sense him, you know he's there. Then the Bible says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Now that you've qualified yourself, it is time now to activate the kingdom rulership, dominion, to now command those things to come to you. And the angels of God who have been given charge over your life to help you, to, to help you in every state of your life as a king in the kingdom of God. They will go locate everything you need and they will bring it to you. And if you believe that God's word is to lift up your hands and say, Father, I thank you. Today I take dominion and I repeat anxiety and fear. I bring the power of poverty and lack. I rebuke every demonic shortage and lack. And, 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 and I command that spirit to leave you because God has called you into life. He says he came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Today I decree and I pronounce you are stepping into the abundance of God. His grace is sufficient for us and we are working in kingdom abundance. We are working according to the economy of heaven. We are not restricted and limited by our necessity or here or there because all these things shall be added. Today we command any spirit of test, any thief that has been stealing from us, we command that spirit to restore to us seven for We decree by the authority of the we are authorized to succeed and we have access to the providence of God. Lift up your voice. Thank God. Bless him. 
and thank him that you are a child of God. What manner of love is this? That we should be called the sons of God. It's about time we access the privilege, the benefit of we being the children of God. Father, we thank you and we bless you and we honor you that we are sons and daughters of your kingdom. You are heavenly, Father. And all these things is added unto us. God bless you for spending some time in the world.